All right, so good to see see you all here. Um, I am back in Atlanta. It was for those of you who joined me for the one of like a hundred events that I've done in the past three weeks. <laughs> um, thank you for joining me. Um, there was this narrative about my team that we were on break this month and everyone was like, I thought you were on break this month. I'm like, everyone else is. <laughs> I am on a teaching, uh, a very low-key teaching tour um, across five states in the Northeast. So that's what I was doing all month. <laughs> Um, so I know I saw some of you there. Um, it was good seeing you. Um, if you came out to one of the events, um, it was all over the place. Manhattan, Western Mass, a couple times, New Hampshire, Burlington, um, Baltimore, which was the last event on Wednesday evening before I came back. So, but in any case, um and yeah just we're gonna wait just one more minute still getting people into the space um yeah so much is happening so much is going on this is always the case <laughs> you know so this space you know as we're working with chin Raisi, right just becomes the space to do a lot of heart work you know just working with the heart and that's you know of course extremely energetic so what we're doing is working with the energy body, you know, our energy, our chakras, our channels, you know, and beginning to like just create some fluidity, right? Um, and in doing this, you know, there are a lot of things that, that we can experience. We, uh, one of the main things I think is definitely physical experiences. You may feel, you know, some, some sensation. I'm not gonna call it pain, but there are, there are sensations when we begin to really work with energy, um, with the energy body, the physical body um, is, is working things out as well, you know? So um, when I'm doing a lot of heart, you know, kind of heart center work, um, I do, you know, I feel a lot of pressure, you know, and sensation in my heart center. Um, and that's kind of one of the consequences of, doing intensive energy work, um, you know, it's that like you have to, you have to be surrounded with really good spiritual energy people as well as like medical Western doctors as well, because everything just goes out the window, <laughs> you know? Um, I can't tell you this year, how many times I've been at my doctor's office and they've been like, um, are you dying right now? Because <laughs> like your heart rate is up and I have all these symptoms and knowing very well that I've been doing all kinds of energy ceremonies. <laughs> you know? And I'm just like, I'm not dying or I don't have all, you know, these conditions. I'm just like moving a lot of energy around. You know, it's hard to have that conversation with your doctors, you know, and there, and therefore you have, you know, your spiritual folks, your energy people, your acupuncturists, you know, your healers, and you get, you start getting balanced, some balanced insight, you know, but definitely a lot of it is this kind of like keeping your mouth shut and saying, okay, I'll take this prescription, you know, for this medication, but it's going to be different in two weeks because I'm changing practices. <laughs> <laughs> you know? um, so yeah, so I say that because I know this is something that we never talk about um, in advanced energy work, you know, like I do, you know, that's something that I've shifted into over the past few years of just really working. And that's Tantra, you know, and I believe that we should get right to the heart of things, you know, um, I can definitely teach sadhana and all the chanting. You know, I started chanting, you know, Chinrezi was the first sadhana that I chanted. And it's beautiful the way that um, my teacher taught Chinrezi and the practice that we did was really beautiful. 
there's a whole bunch of chanting. <laughs> you know, and you're just like, and then by the end, it's like, okay, what just happened? You know, um, but you know, going just like really directly, like working with breath, working with visualizations, working with energy, and really just essentially attuning directly to the consciousness or into the consciousness of Chinarizi, um, I think it is really helpful, extremely helpful, actually. Um, it's, it's, yeah, in a way, it's a shortcut, but it still gets you there, <laughs> right? Sometimes I don't understand this kind of, like, intense loyalty to, like, going the long way around. Like, we don't really have a lot of time, you know? We don't have as much time as we think we do. We actually, you know, nothing's actually ever guaranteed. So in this moment, let's just go and meet Chinrezi. <laughs> <laughs> you know, let's just get right to it. Let's just get into the heart of things um, as well. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, you know, and then there's, there's some other stuff, you know, um, I keep saying there's lots of announcements to make about some new projects. Um, and this is part of it, you know, this new thing that is just emerging, but we'll announce it next year, actually what we're doing, a little bit of a training that we're gonna undergo. Um, so anyway, um, yeah. And uh, so welcome also for those of you who are new as well. Um, if you're just joining us for the first time, this is our Chinrezig practice, our monthly Chinrezig practice. Chinrezig is the Bodhisattva of love uh, in uh, Tibetan Buddhism, The uh, what we would say like the like the main deity in many ways of um of Tibetan Buddhism. Uh Om Mani Peme Hum, right, is the main mantra. And this is like for me, it was the first mantra that I learned also um coming into the practice. Um and Om Mani Peme Hum and really the practice of Chinrezi is really about union. Um, for me, union is an expression of the erotic. Um, and the erotic, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's related to sex, right? Um, but really the, the practice of union as explored through, um, the tradition of Chinrezi is really about coming back together, bringing, bringing things that seem extreme and desperate back into wholeness, right? And that is actually what love is, is actually bringing things back through into wholeness through the particular practice of deep acceptance, of deep allowance, right? So acceptance and allowance isn't, um, um, again, has nothing to do with condoning or agreeing with anything. It just means that we're doing this really intensive work of allowing things to arise as they are. And then once something arises as it is, then you can respond you know, and make a choice as to how you want to be in relationship to the thing that we've allowed to arise through the practice of deep acceptance or deep love, right? And this is what we're doing in Chinrezi, opening, allowing, expanding, you know, disrupting the ways that we're always like manipulating things and changing things and shifting things, you know, to actually allow this kind of like expanding to allow everything to arise, letting go of our agreement or disagreement with it, the saying this is it, you know, this is happening, this is arising. And that's what we're doing, you know, in a really functional way with self-love, we're allowing ourselves to be, you know, and going through that process of coming back into wholeness. And when we come back into wholeness, that means that we actually have to hold space for the things that we habitually run away from, the things that we don't like to admit about ourselves, usually the pain, the trauma, the guilt, heartbreak, so forth, and the things that don't feel good, you know, the things that we're always pushing away. And what we're trying to do is bring everything back into focus and just expanding and allowing and seeing and naming, right? And then as you do that, you're entering into the process of experiencing, like you begin to experience all the stuff that you're 
running away from or distracting yourself from, right? And that's what we begin to feel as love, you know? And so when we go back to the mantra, Omani Peme Hong, like, you know, behold the jewel and the lotus, right? You know, it's like the jewel and the lotus are the, you know, the male principle and the fem female principle coming back together into union. So the holy sacred duality is coming back into oneness. And that energy is being embodied in our practice. We're bringing ourselves back into wholeness which yes, can feel good, but also can can feel like very uncomfortable. You know, integration can feel deeply uncomfortable, right? Um, because we're having to process and move through these experiences of, of pain that we haven't metabolized or dealt with, right? Um, and of course, also what creates a barrier is the trauma around um, conditional love that I would say all of us have survived in some way, right? So conditional love, meaning that like we haven't actually been allowed to be whole, um, that we have had to perform a version of ourselves in order to get the resources that we need, you know, and many of us were getting that, you know, growing up, you know, definitely. I was... I survived that, you know, I can't be my whole true self, right? And so I have to like be a version of myself because if I'm completely myself, then there are consequences, you know, I, I get kicked out, right? Um, I get um, restricted from the resources that I need, right? Um, and so, so that's something that some of us will have to contend with in the practice is that for the first time, we actually have to start naming ourselves fully and completely and pushing up against the ways in which we taught ourselves or the ways that we've been taught that we can't get our resources met if we're completely honest about who we are. You know, um, shame is a big part of this, of course, shame, Fear, you know, shame is fear of, again, not getting what we need to survive, right? And shame is deeply programmed into us. And so shame is something that this practice begins to, to work with as well. Um, and so this deep, deep allowing, like for me, Therese, and particularly in the way that I'm, you know, offering it right now, it's just very, very, very personal very vulnerable, very inward. Like we're not doing a whole bunch of express expressing care and love, you know, for others. Um, it's a deep personal experience of opening and allowing, right? Recognizing Shinrizi as uh, an expression of space and emptiness itself, right? And energy, right? And just always returning <clears throat> returning back to that that kind of like reflection right that all this discomfort that I'm experiencing in the practice is itself an expression of emptiness and space and energy right the same nature of this pain that I'm experiencing is also the nature the essence the nature of Chen raising and all the Buddhas right, and all phenomena, right, and ultimately, like, that's what we're always coming back to um, in the Vajrayana, is, is always remembering and training to remember, well, training to remember and training to experience the ultimate nature of all phenomena, right, and I think suffering really intensifies when we, when we, when we think that there's certain things that are not the expression of emptiness in space. And I think that really trips us up quite a bit. And that's why, you know, for me, early on, it was always like just kind of drilling myself, you know, well, actually, that's not the, the appropriate image there. But like, <laughs> you know, um, 
like drilling, drilling myself, right? You know, um, it's not that kind of talk today, but like drilling in over and over again, this, um, I would say mantra or teaching that everything, everything is an expression of emptiness, everything, right? When I say, oh, not this, not this trauma, this trauma is real, it's solid, it's tangible. And when I catch myself thinking that, then I go right back into that mantra. No, everything, everything is an expression. There's nothing that isn't an expression of emptiness and space and energy, right? There's nothing that doesn't manifest from emptiness. There's nothing that will, you know, eventually there, everything will return back to emptiness, right? Including um, um, any idea of who we think we are, what we think we are, that has to return back to emptiness. And that is essentially awakening is when we realize that it's like, oh, this is everything is just an expression of emptiness, right? And returning back to emptiness, like that kind of rest, you know, is what we would call um, nirvana um, as well. Um, right, so, so we'll begin um, with, uh, with our practice here. Um, and I just, you know, we always want to start with just checking in with our bodies. You know, it's just like, how how is my body doing? What does my body need right now? This is incredibly important. So allowing your bodies to come into a position that feels appropriate for practice. And appropriate means, again, that it's coming into some space where I'm able to hold both comfort and discomfort, right? To hold it in, in a balanced way so that neither comfort or discomfort becomes distracting. So it's coming back into this middle way, right? And allowing our bodies to be in any position, again, you don't have to be sitting up, like you don't have to like, be sitting in full lotus or anything like that. And offering this kind of attention to the body and permission to the body um, is so important in terms of the kindness that we begin to offer ourselves. If there's no kindness to the body initially, it's going to be really hard for us to like open up and lean into the spaciousness that Chandrasi is offering us in practice. As I often say these days, when in doubt, just relax. <laughs> you know, when in doubt, relax. And start over, start again. Like this is, you know, I don't want to keep too much into it, but like this is really where and how the deity begins to arise. The deity is a physical experience as well as an energetic experience. But we're not trying to like push away the body to have an experience of any deity, any Buddha, right? But fundamentally understanding that the deity arises out of the experience of our bodies. You know, that the experience of the body is needed to pair with the experience of mine. So as I'm sitting here, just to make this even more tangible, I am beginning to think, oh, my body is also Chinrezig's body. And just noticing that, 
when you tell yourself, oh, my body, both the pleasure and the pain, all of this is also an expression of the deity. And when we begin to think like that and train in that kind of understanding, then our fixation to ego, and particularly ego's attachment to the physical body, right, begins to relax. Maybe over time, <laughs> you know, you may be saying, I don't feel shit, you know, and we start somewhere. <laughs> Congratulations, you started. But again, there is no deity in this practice. There's no Buddha in this practice without my body. No matter how much I may struggle with my body, my body must always be invited into this intimate expression as the deity. So I am Chinrezi. My body is Chinrezi's body. My voice is the voice of Chinrezi. But if my voice is the voice of Chinrezi, then my voice is the voice of all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. And if my voice is all of that, then we come back to our foundational mantra, which is that my voice, like the voice of all Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, is an expression of emptiness. So again, initially, we're just exploring what our experience of ourselves is when we're saying our bodies are expressions of Chinrezi, of the deity, of any deity, any Buddha or Bodhisattva right now. And this is the, the root or the beginning of the creation stage in Vajrayana. So we're creating something, but in a way it's already created. We are all already Buddhas. We're just trying to remember that by intentionally like taking on, you know, this performance as the deity, as the Buddha here, the Buddha Chinrezi, well, the Bodhisattva Chinrezi. But the creation, like when we start training and believing we are the deity as a means to return back to an authentic expression of ourselves as awakened, as enlightened, like all of that has to begin with this basic kind of belief, training in the belief I am in this moment, right? Everything that arises is also the expression of Chinrezi. And the, <clears throat> and the more we do that, the more space opens up because we're disrupting fixation to the sense of I and beginning to re-identify with this expression, this sacred expression of emptiness and space and energy. 
So there's a space that opens up when we begin to disrupt fixation to this very relative sense of I. The deity, the Buddha, is an experience. Right? Everything that arises from emptiness is just an experience. So as we're saying that we're chenrezig, we're also saying, and yes, and this experience, this is just an experience. So I am chenrezig. I am this sacred experience of emptiness and space and this luminous energy. And we're beginning to attune, like attune empowerment. Like this is it also. This is the empowerment beginning to happen. The empowerment is my adjusting to the particular kind of frequency or vibration of Chen Rizzi. And so as Chinrezi, right, as this experience of awakened consciousness, we know that our only intention, our only aspiration now becomes to more deeply embody and express freedom and liberation and to help all beings and literally all phenomena experience freedom and liberation. And all phenomena is freed or needs to be freed from our misunderstanding of it. Like everything that I sense through my sense faculties, right? All of that is misunderstood to be real, right? And so to free all phenomena that I'm encountering and feeling is to just remember that everything is an expression of emptiness and that everything, because it arises from emptiness, should always be reminding me to return back to emptiness, to experience ultimate liberation. And that's how we free phenomena, is to always remember that phenomena is always pointing us back home to emptiness. We can also feel and experience the earth rising to hold us. And the earth also being an expression of emptiness. The earth also being 
I believe an expression of a Buddha or an awakened consciousness. And a, an awakened consciousness is a consciousness that knows itself. Okay. You know, as Milarepa, you know, one of the great yogi saints um, in the Kagi school, once said that, like, we're practicing for awareness to gaze upon itself. And when awareness starts gazing upon its own inherent awareness, right, which is consciousness, then we're awakened from the illusion of realness. So just exploring this for just a little bit longer. Right? This is the birthplace of all the Buddhas, all the Bodhisattvas. But particularly now, this is like the awakening space of Chinrezi. This deep allowance, this deep acceptance, this unfolding, unwake, awakening. and just resting. To be a Buddha or to, to be awakened just means that, just, that, that there is just a resting, a letting go of creating, manipulating, arranging, organizing, and just being, resting, opening, being. And everything that we feel like we're struggling with, be it physical sensations, right? Be it mental experiences, thoughts, emotions. We're responding to these experiences. We're taking care of ourselves. We're making decisions, right? But always coupling whatever response we're engaged with, with this reflection that everything is expressing itself from emptiness within this profound space that pervades emptiness along with this energy, this luminosity. And it's this energy or luminosity that gives rise to phenomena. So even in a way, everything that we're sensing, experiencing, can even in a way dissolve back into just this fundamental energy that pervades the boundlessness experience, the boundless experience of emptiness and space.
So as we continue to move a little deeper into the practice, I invite you to bring and we'll shift your attention to your heart center and still also thinking of yourself, believing yourself as Shinrazi. And you can see your body as this kind of translucent expression of Shinrazi or simply resting within the thought that I am Shinrazi is all you know, fine, right? But regardless, in our heart centers, we begin to imagine the mantra, Om Mani Padme Ho, and you can imagine the mantra in, in the English syllables. And imagine that they're in a circle in the heart center. So they're just the mantra is just arranged as a circle, a mantra circle in the heart center. And we can imagine that the mantra circle just begins to radiate like blue, translucent, soft energy. And as it's radiating, we can also imagine that the mantra circle begins to rotate as well. So the mantra circle is rotating and radiating soft blue light. And the blue light represents the awakened mind as well. So blue is like mind. And just experimenting with that just for a couple of moments and just noticing any physical sensations. And again, the circling mantra, radiating blue light, and just relaxing settling into that expression of blue light as well. And then slowly, I invite you to imagine <clears throat> that within the mantra circle, in your heart center, an image or an expression of Chinrezi awakens or emerges.
We're going to <clears throat> transition to also into this our mantra practice. <clears throat> and we're going to actually try a new melody for the mantra, which is the same melody um, as Amitabha's mantra that I often do in retreats, folks. So some of you already know the melody um, as well. But we're going to try the melody. And of course, we're just chanting this in our own space, right? So, um, but just beginning to slowly chant this and just sitting uh, and opening, expanding just into ourselves as Shinrazi with the mantra will, the radiance of light, blue light, and Shinrazi in the middle of that circle as well and just sitting you know working with the mantra from this this space okay <clears throat> and i'll begin and you come in whenever it feels appropriate right om mani padme ho om mani padme ho Oh, money and me. Oh, money and me. Oh, money and me. Oh, money and me. Om Mani Padme Ho. 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 Oh, Mani, and me, oh, oh, Mani, and me, oh, oh, Mani, and me, oh, oh, Mani, and me, oh. Om Mani Padme Ho. 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 
Now slowly begin to dissolve the humming into stillness and silence. And 
if it's letting the last syllable, the last poem, just slowly, softly, sweetly dissolve into emptiness. And returning your attention back to the heart center, the radiance of blue kind of expressing itself and radiating in the heart center. We slowly begin to imagine that this blue light becomes so strong, begins to emanate so strongly from our heart centers that everything including ourselves as Shinrazi, begins to dissolve into that blue light. And we begin to experience our consciousness, our awareness, as this radiance of blue light permeating all of space and emptiness. And allowing ourselves just to rest to be aware, to be open and expansive. Slowly, we begin to re-arise back in our physical states, allowing the body to come back into focus.
touching into how the seat is rising to hold us and anchor us as we return back to this timeline. Beginning to offer some movement back into the body as well as breath and moving through some deep cleansing breaths and releasing anything that feels stuck or rigid or tight. So thank you so much for your practice. And we'll open up the rest of our time uh, for questions, as well if you have any questions about anything. And you can put questions into the chat as well. Thank Lorena. Lorena. Thank you. Um, Hi, Lamara. Hey. Um, thank you so much for this practice. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a bit more as you were doing in the beginning of the talk about um, the nature of emptiness to help us remember when we get caught in our small stories of mm -hmm. what we don't like, mm -hmm. uh, what we think we are, mm -hmm. you know, how to remember mm -hmm. um, just a constantly constant kind of trying to come home and remember yeah. this, is not, this is just an experience as you were saying, you know, yeah. um, but when we're so caught in it, um, yeah, I wonder if you could speak to that, how to, how to support us with that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, one of the key things is to, we're just training. You know, there's no magic here initially, except just remembering as quickly as possible or as soon as possible to return back to the experience of everything. You know, and it may be well after, you know, the experience of getting hooked by something. But that's still really important because over time, you're going to start waking up sooner and sooner to these experiences, right? Right? Sometimes it's like you really blow it, like you, you know, we have a reaction, something happens. And then maybe it's like well after that experience where we have space to reflect and say, you know what, that was just an experience, right? The more we do that, the more we, we're learning to kind of wake up as quickly as possible, right? And this is also the same training for dream yoga as well as one of the six yogas. Is that like we're just moving through the world through our daily lives and saying, yeah, everything is an experience, you know, everything is an experience, you know, and of course an experience happens, you get trapped by it, 
then the experience leaves, you know. Um, and as soon as it leaves, you're like, okay, I know I got hooked, but that was just an experience. Again, the more you do all of that, the more everything begins to kind of relax more and more over time. You know? And it becomes something that's embodied and you feel the embodiment of emptiness because everything again gets really fluid, really translucent. Everything, you begin to feel everything as naturally being full of potential. You know, and that's when you know the practice is really, really getting embodied. You feel that deep fluidity. Thank you. If I could just follow up, like I've been um, trying to practice this labeling what's what's happening. Like, oh, hello, irritation. Hey, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> Just uh, and holding like there's a part of me that's feeling that. So, me, you know, I try to hold myself physically. Like, oh, oh, I feel feel some heaviness and sadness. Like, okay, let me yeah, with this. that's um, it. It just feels like I could do that like all day, <laughs> seven. And I guess sometimes, um, maybe just going for a walk. Yeah. Somebody. Yeah. And uh, yeah, thank you. It's just a, a constant practice. There's no magic. Yeah. Point. Yeah, that's all it is, is constant training. Yeah. Yeah. But thank you. Thank you for your practice. And I see a question here from David. So when we become the deity, is this a visualization or something more transcendent? You know, it's it um it is just well it's just a thought actually right it's a thought that becomes a belief the visualization isn't important honestly <laughs> like um a lot of people can't do the visualization right there are great awakened masters who don't do visualizations right um a visualization isn't my main practice either it's the belief you know, it's the belief that begins to disrupt the realness of everything and the space that begins to awaken from that, you know. Um, but we always begin with the thought, I am, like I am the deity, right? And then from there, whatever happens, happens. Like you can go into a visualization of your body as an expression of the deity, that's fine, you know? And if you don't do that, that's fine as well. The belief is the central thing here. You know, you can visualize all day long, but you have to like believe that this visualization is rooted within the fluidity and translucent nature of phenomena. Like you have to, you have to connect all of that, you know, or else it just becomes entertainment, you know, or an experience you know, that you objectify, right? And make it something that it's not supposed to be. Or you make it into something um, that makes you feel special, right? And that's just the ego working to, to assimilate that experience. Um... And then the follow up isn't belief of a bit of magic, isn't the belief a bit of magic, just getting sort of, yeah. Well, it is magic too. Like that is, you know, Tantra is magic, right? Um, it's magic that's about getting free and benefiting people. It's a very specific kind of magic. And it's only because of bodhicitta. If there was no bodhicitta, then, you know, you could, as as people do, you know, tantra is neither good or bad. It's just, it's just is. And then when we do the Buddhist side of tantra, we add a little bit of intention and then we start channeling all of that, you know, into something beneficial. But you can use tantra to create a lot of harm as well. People do, you know. I had a teacher... I do have a teacher, a Tibetan teacher, who would always make us wear 
um, these protection amulets all the time, you know, and and if he saw me, like if I would go and visit him, if he saw me not wearing it, then he would give me another one, <laughs> you know, you know, and talk about how like, you know, not everyone is doing Tantra for the right reasons. And so you have to protect yourself. Um, this Wangdu, Sering Wangdu Rinpoche, which is the teacher, Justin, Lam Justin and I share together. Um, but there is another question from Kay, why different tunes from mantra? Just intuition, <laughs> you know, it's just like, I just want to do something different. Uh, plus, the standard Om Mani Padme Hum mantra is just really hard <laughs> to chant. So I was like, I don't want to go through that. You know, it's just a hard mantra to chant. It's a hard melody, you know. And then, okay. Uh, I, did, so, I did experience that myself as I was singing this time. It didn't. It I didn't get worn out as quickly, and I wondered if it was just my. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's a. It's an easier. It's an easier tune. You know, with the old tune, you're just you're just up and down these registers, and it's like I just don't have the range today. <laughs> you know. Um, and it's a hard one for groups to sing too. But anyway, I I think it's really nice to change up tunes and, and melodies and everything um, as well. Like it's again, like you have to you have to take some initiative to be creative and explore the practice instead of just repeating everything that you're given. You know, that was something too, you know, after living in the monastery and realizing that like so much of what we did was because our teacher did it. And then I would be like, so why are we doing this? And literally sometimes the answer would be, oh, Rinpoche did this once, you know, 30 years ago, and now we all do it, you know? And I was just like, well, I don't really get it. And so if I don't get it, I can't do it. Like, I just don't, like, that's the whole thing about, like, taking more agency in your practice. Like, you're asking yourself, like, why am I doing this? You know, and I had to, I gave up a lot of stuff, a lot of etiquette, because I literally could not explain why I was doing it. If you can't explain why you're not doing anything, then the practice is going to get real meaningless. <laughs> Right. And then that's when you lose interest in practice because it just becomes this rote autopilot activity, you know, that you start disconnecting from. This is why everything that I do, if you've noticed over the years, everything that I'm doing is to bring meaning into practice that's appropriate for how I am and how we're showing up in this moment, you know. Um, and you have to. You have to stay engaged, you know. This is why, you know, in the future, when I write practices, more practices and, you know, and liturgies, there's going to be a whole bunch of, like, you know, like, you know, just going to be a lot of, like, okay, here's what I say, but say this in a way that makes sense for you, you know. And that's a, this is also how I get rituals and ceremonies from the teachers that I practice with and other traditions they're like this is how i do it but you have to figure out the way that makes sense for you you know so that's all we're doing you know? uh, so rachel uh yeah i wanted to say something and i want to ask you something yeah. and the saying is even sort of an asking but it seems to me like um with this whole idea that we all inherently have buddha nature that to do a practice where you, whether you think it or you visualize yourself as being one of these deities, is like really taking that seriously. Yes. That's my Buddha nature. Yeah. And it's not, um, it's not held prisoner by our central nervous system. Right. So yes. it's, it's another level of energy and consciousness and openness 
it's free from that. Yeah. And um, one of the things, I mean, this just came to me the other day, doing a sadhana practice where you do the Zahun Banho, where the, the deity becomes one with you. It's like the bringing together of the, of the me with the nervous system that's sort of wrecked at the moment <laughs> with the me that is the awakened Buddha nature and that maybe that me can hold the other one. Does that make sense? Like the yeah. awakened one can. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I just want to say that. So in that sense, I mean, it's, I agree with you, it's all magic, but in some sense, if, if we really want to take any of this seriously, even if you're Jewish or Christian, the idea I'm made in the image of God, it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I just am so grateful, actually, for the way you explain things and also the practice of I'm really practicing getting in touch with this essential truth that I have Buddha nature. And this is a way to do it. So I wanted to say that and see if that. OK. Yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. That's okay. it. So then the other thing is my little nervous system is <laughs> a little bonkers right now. So my son is having a health issue, which I think is all going to turn out fine. But really, please, this is where I tell people don't ever have children. Because <laughs> if you want to wreck your nervous system, be worried about one of your children. Anyway, so I am just curious, really, on a super practical level, because that's when it all goes out the window, right? When that level of anxiety is like, if you have any any just practical mm -hmm. things that just come to mind spontaneously, I would appreciate that. Yeah, well, well, you know, you know, it goes back to love and fixation, and you know, it's you know, as you you know, as you kind of pointed out jokingly, but I think it's real. It's like there we have we form deep attachments you know, to to people, right? To our beloveds, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and that worry is a part of, I think, maybe a way that we're trying to shift um, circumstances for people mm -hmm. we love, right? And then we kind of get kind of trapped in it because it becomes so future-oriented. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like we 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 need this to happen. We We don't want them to suffer, but they will. You know, people will suffer. People will have to go through things, you know. Um, and how do we hold that? And just with space, it's like, yeah, I'm going to worry because I love you, right? And I'm going to worry, you know. The same way I had this conversation with my mother. Yeah, well, she was having a conversation with me last night. Okay. <laughs> and okay. I was responding about how she's always worried. Hmm. About me being in the world and like everything is going on I'm always traveling and in all these really intense places and like like how does she hold on to me you know and you know I'm just like you can't though <laughs> like you know nor am I someone who's going to like not do what I need to do because someone that I love is worried about me mm -hmm. you know that's the consequence that comes from me being very clear about what I'm doing in this life. And that love is not for me to be fixated on people, it's for me to help people get free from suffering. That's the burden that I take on as a teacher. Mm -hmm. right? You know, I love you, even people close to me, I love you, I want you to be well, and I also know that we're gonna die. Yes. Right? yes. You know, and that, yeah, and that my heart will break right and then all of that's going to happen but i'm not afraid of that mm -hmm. like i consciously choose to lean into the consequences of deep personal love for people mm -hmm. of course my heart is going to break of course i'm going to be disappointed right and i have this practice mm -hmm. to call in to hold space for the brokenheartedness and the disappointment and the worry mm -hmm. You know, and I also know that like, yeah, and there is this process that I have to hold and I deeply believe in, you know, this process of being born, moving through life and dying, right? You know, so yeah, so all of that, you know, I would say just comes to mind. 
Yeah, that's helpful. Yeah. It's also helpful um, to be in a context like this mm-hmm. and to have this conversation. Yes. It's very helpful. So yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely. So there's a question in the chat again. In dream yoga, I've heard it said that if we manifest unwholesome thoughts, then we produce negative karma. Well, you know, all of this is really kind of subjective. You know, what is an unwholesome thought? <laughs> you know, um, there may be thoughts that you consider unwholesome. I may consider quite wholesome <laughs> for me, right? You know, so again, subjectivity is really important. Um, karma karma um is subjective <laughs> as well um again you know we have to just come back to this place of saying what is conducive and not conducive to liberation to getting free that's the ethical system that i'm trying to get people tuned into you know it's like what's going to get me free what isn't going to get me free there are things that are going to get you free that's not going to get me free Right. And just acknowledging that. But, you know, more more specifically for the question on wholesome thoughts. Yeah. You know, I think that. Um, um, an unwholesome thought doesn't produce anything. You know, it's our relationship to a thought that produces karma. Now, that thought may arise from karma, but we engage with that karma by reacting or responding in certain ways to the thought, right? Um, so when a thought, like an, an unwholesome, like maybe like you have a thought about hurting someone. Okay, you know, we can call that unwholesome maybe, you know, in general. Now I have those thoughts pretty regularly. Yeah, I, I do want to put my hands on certain people, <laughs> you know, not to bless them, but to like enact harm, right? And I have to name that. You know, sometimes I just want to hit people. That, you know, is probably an unwholesome thought, right? But it doesn't matter because I can disrupt my reactivity to that and just let that thought be there. And then you free yourself from the cycle of karma that could have been created from that thought, right? Even though that thought may come from unwholesome karma or negative karma, I can disrupt that by disrupting the reactivity to it and releasing that thought, you know? Um, And there are things in, you know, in dreams that just have to work themselves out, you know? Like you may be having a series of nightmares, that's energy working itself out, right? And it's visualized and experienced and and maybe really somatic. So it's like you just offer that, those experiences space right? Now, it may be something at the root of that, you know, that you may have to kind of investigate or get someone, you know, to do, you know. Um, Again, I believe I have a team of people around me um, that I connect to pretty regularly that do really specific things, you know. I have dream interpreters that are just like, you know, really into and now, you know, manifesting, you know, and analyzing dreams, I have energy workers that I work with, I have ritualists, you know, um, I used to have a tantric sex, you know, advisor and teacher, like literally I pull in people, other healers and teachers and advisors so I can just go to them with specific questions about things. So I don't rely on just one person or even just one teacher for anything. You know, and that's why I do what I do. This is why I manifest the practices that I do because they're coming from a lot of support from different people. You know, um, in any case, one last question. I think that is, oh yeah, Mandar. I think Miles may have had their head raised first. Oh, I don't know. I don't. I can't see everyone, so I just see whoever's in front of me. Okay, Miles, we'll take these. I know this is five minutes past, so you can drop off anytime you want. <laughs> um, yeah. Where's Miles at? I'm here. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Lamara. Hey, it's good to see you. You still in Louisiana? 
Yeah, but um, I'm actually moving to Atlanta around the end of the year. Oh, yeah, that's what Spring said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll uh, give y'all a holla when I when I get around. Okay. Um, but so earlier you said, um, well, my question is, how can we relate to deity, um, with like the rest of our experience? So, like earlier you said that um, we can, the thought that is deity can like disrupt Mm -hmm. um, how we relate to the rest of our experience. Yeah. And could you say more about that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, the, the, the central thing around deity practice um, is initially disrupting this fixed sense of who we think we are. You know, so like right now you're like, okay, I'm Miles, this is who I am, you know, blah, blah, blah. And we get really fixed into that, that status, right? So when we start practicing working with the deity, then we start saying, you know what, I am actually this deity, right? And the deity is actually just an expression of emptiness and space and energy. So even if it's just for a second of belief, we are disrupting fixation to ego and we don't come back to ego the same way we were before. Again, even if it's just for a second. So that's deity practice is helping us to get space in between the sense of self and this true authentic expression of who we actually are. Mm-hmm. You know. So then we start actually understanding that everything is experience, right? And that I can choose eventually just to be free, right? Through maybe the doorway of taking on the deity. Okay. And that opens up space for you to begin to explore other parts of who you are that could actually be used to help experience more spaciousness as well. You know, if you're one experience, you're gonna be a hundred experiences, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Mm-hmm. And... Mandar, are you still here? <laughs> oh, I am still here. Okay. Uh, okay. Are you still thinking too much about things? Oh, always. Uh, I don't expect to have that sorted out for a few lifetimes at least. Um, wow, you nailed it. Speaking of which, um, I've been I've been overthinking, I think, uh, that like the core meaning of the Chin Raisi mantra recently. Okay. That okay. um You say that the essence of everything is union, which I actually really quite like, but the construction of the mantra itself is Mm -hmm. a little more, these two things that seem like they're opposite are actually one thing, like yin and yang are ultimately one. And that used to feel very liberatory for me. And lately it's actually felt a little bit limiting, especially through a queer and gendered lens. Mm -hmm. I've never really experienced masculinity or femininity as isolatable or kind of the end of the story. Like it sort of feels like it points out a false dichotomy, but first it sort of re-overlays the dichotomy. Yeah. Want to expand my thinking on that? Well, you know, but then you take it all further and you say, well, it's all just a game anyway too so it's like yeah we're we're praying playing with these dualities you know but then you get stuck in that cycle trying to make it make sense and it won't make sense because it's an experience that we're trying to embody that opens to this massive experience that actually can't be named but can can be experienced right and then of course that massive experience is emptiness itself um, but I think emptiness is actually more than just an experience. I think it's just a state. It's just 
it just is, you know, and we can experience, we can embody emptiness as experiences of spaciousness, um, but that the grander, the bigger experience or the bigger state is emptiness itself. However, like going back to your question, yeah, it's just like when it feels limiting, just release it back into emptiness because that's what you're going back to anyway. You know, it's just, yeah, everything is just like this mm -hmm. phenomenon, illusions and dreams and impressions, right? And then how do I actually just return back to some experience of the state of emptiness itself, right? Um, Again, when things get really complicated, again, just relax. You know, just relax and come back because relaxing is the only way we're going to get back into the state of emptiness anyway. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. You know, all of this, you know, just in, I know that we're going to end, we're going to kind of wrap it up here. Um, you know, um, I th I would just say for me initially, I know some of you are brand new to this tradition and definitely brand new to what I'm doing because this is um, perpetually ever emerging <laughs> in the second. So like, I just, you know, like you just kind of have, kind of have to hold on and just, you know, see what's going to come out of my mouth. But like thinking about my, earlier days in the practice everything was just like like I didn't understand anything all the concepts the words the dogma I was like I don't get it and people were trying to tell me I was reading every book I could get my hands on I didn't understand anything you know and the best advice I kept getting was just like you just have to go and just practice just keep practicing keep sitting keep watching your mind these basic you know, you know, kind of practice suggestions. I just, I just, you know, I was just like, you know, I don't get any of this, but I'm, I can sit and practice and being aware and and feeling the earth under me and things like that, right? And over time, it begins to make more sense, you know. But um, but definitely, it's easy to get overwhelmed by the complexity of everything and all the complexity. Again, always goes back to emptiness. It's just all the ways in which we're trying to get back to our most authentic original states, you know. But we have to be careful about the ways in which the ego actually gets kind of too fixated on wanting everything to make sense, you know. Um, and we get trapped in wanting everything to work out logically. And that takes precedent over what we're actually trying to do, which is experience, you know, embody. So you know, I just wanted just to, to, to point that out, you know. Um, everything that I'm able to do is really because I can experience you know, and be with and relax and open. That's really what's happening, you know, um, for me. And that's therefore I, I, I can use, again, I don't have to rely on like texts and, and writings of other folks. Like I can say, oh, but this is my experience of the states, you know, and I can use different words and different language and I can, I can get into it in different ways, right? And that's what we're trying to get to because it is emptiness itself that is the ultimate guru, is the primary teacher. You know, not the books, not the scriptures, not the Buddha even, but like it's emptiness. Emptiness is the primary teacher, right? And the more we connect to that state of emptiness, the more wisdom, clarity becomes a lived embodied experience that continues to produce clarity and compassion over and over again. This is why training, coming back to emptiness over and over and over again is so incredibly important because again, that's where, that's where the 
the wisdom is really emerging from uh, as well. Okay, so anyway, we've gone past time. Thank you all so much for hanging in there. Thank you to Eric for hosting the space um, and keeping it open. Um, and maybe I'll see some of you tomorrow afternoon for um, for the spiritual abolition course starting and maybe Monday night uh, for medicine. Building. Okay. All right. Thank you, everyone. Please be well. And I'll see you soon in some fashion. All right.